Powell's perspective. Whatever art thou doing, stripling? Comes a loud woman's voice from somewhere. Terrified, I look up from the dead s'more and cast around, searching for the Nord demon who seems like she can almost speak Polish. I see nothing. I don't want to start running until I know I'm not going to be running towards her. Hello? I say nervously, trying to get the demon to show herself. Shouldest thou be seeking for mine self, thou shalt be dissatisfied. Here be no personage upon the visage of which thou mayest rest thine eyes. Yet, if thou wishest to look somewhere, look thee hither, to the bark, stripling, answers the voice, whose words of pronunciation are both very strange. Where? I ask, understanding her telling me to look somewhere, but not having understood at all where. The navette, the vessel, the taker. The taker? I ask, horrified. What the hell are they taking? Disregard the word that affright with thee so. Dost thou grasp transport? I look at the flying house. Your that? Indubitably, art thou surprised? I never spoke with a house before, but then I suppose I never saw a flying house before today either. I answer the demon house. I wonder whether I should run, but, well, I saw how fast the flying house could move earlier. There's exactly no way I'd outrun her when she can cover tens of kilometers in minutes. I could hide in the trees, but with how heavy she looks, she could probably just come down on top of me and crush both the trees and me together. Thy locutions presenteth something of a challenge to appreciation, stripling. Canst thou appreciate mine own? says the demon house, asking something but... What? Ah, the response beeth a nay, then. Let us start at the beginning, stripling. Mine appellation beef twiller. What beef thine own? Ah, uh, you're asking for my name? I frown. Indubitably. Thy name. I'm not sure I want to give my name to a demon house, even if she did ask politely. The flying house gives a hearty laugh and responds, Thou thinkest me a demon, stripling. Uproarious. I shrug. I don't know. You might be a bogawi, but I don't really want to give my name to one of them either. I don't really want to give my name to someone who is definitely not human. Absolve mine unworthy self of my discourtesy, but were I a demon, would I have offered thee mine own name so freely? Provide they not to mortals the names of demonkin, dominion over the demon whose names they are? Maybe, I answer cautiously. I have learned a lot about demonly today. That wasn't in any stories I've heard. I'm not sure how much I want to trust to folk wisdom. And shouldst thou have found thyself conversant with a divinity, would she have need to solicit thy name from thee? My mouth twists as I say, I guess not. Fine, it's Powell. Powell, an esteem and a privilege it is to be acquainted with thee. Now... Whither hast thou come, Powell? What? What place dost thou entitle thy abode? She rephrases. What? Where art thou from? Oh, I'm from Malbok, but you knew that already, didn't you? I knew not the name of thy township, Powell, though I knew its latitude and longitude upon this globe. You're polite for a demon house? Ah, I should elucidate. I be no demon, nor be any of those thou art liable to have seen, making use of my transport. They be mortals, of substance and blood. 
howsoever it may have looked to thee. And what are you? Pardon? You said they were flesh and blood. I asked what you are. She laughs. Thou art shrewd, stripling. She pauses, seeming like she is thinking before answering. I be no demon, nor divinity neither. However, thou art precise in thy assessment that I am no creature of flesh and blood. I am a cognizance fashioned from metal and silicon, not a presence born of natural milieu, but one forged by the hands of other cognizant beings. Like the old stories, I say. Thinking back to the past of the story where people say that the Pliaki used to be able to think, almost like a person. I know not thy stories, Stripling, so I cannot say. All right, well, it's been surprisingly nice to talk with you, Twilla, but I should probably go, I say, turning to climb back up the hill and hoping she doesn't try to stop me. Tarry thee a moment. She stops me, sounding strangely desperate. Relate to me one of thy tales, Powell. I turn back to her and say, Look, I was getting firewood on top of the hill, and I need to carry it home. It's a long way and it's going to be dark in a few hours. Zmari might not be any problem for you, but I do not want to be outside the palisades without being able to see. However, uh... I frown. Why are you really so keen for me to stay? I began turning, causing her to say, No, do not. But I ignore her and keep turning, until I see the band of demony coming back, only a few hundred meters away. You tricked me, I say, looking at the house in horror. Then I dart for the trees. The flying house shouts after me, but I don't hear what she says. The demony begins sprinting towards me the moment I begin running. I should be able to make it to the trees before they get anywhere near me. Once I'm in there, I can lose them in the tangled maze of paths through the brush. Fuck the stick bundles, I just need to get home. I just need to not be caught by the demony. I make it to the path and am just congratulating myself on having practically already lost them, when I ran the corner and practically run into one. One of the almost human looking ones, the helmeted one in leathers and furs, the one who I thought was a normal height, but now I'm close to him, I see he's basically the same height as Withold. I skid to a halt and try to bolt in the other direction, but he effortlessly grabs me by the scruff of the neck and yanks me backward, causing me to stumble into him. I turn to look up into his expressionless face, scarred with what I recognize as claw marks, though too small to be from Azmora. His eyes are an unnatural orange. He jabs a finger forward, and in a flat, neutral tone commands, Batisma. He walks me out of the brush, still grasping me by the scruff of my neck. You got him, Tamacha, shouts the leader, with a single glowing green eye, sounding relieved. Me and my captor meet the band, allowing me to see, up close, just how terrifying they are. The blonde man, who I thought was normal looking, is taller than Whittled. The dark-skinned woman is almost as tall. The tallest woman I've ever seen, present company excluded. The only one of these women who is even close to a normal height is the sort of armour with the woman's face buried in his helmet, and I'm not sure she or it counts. She's about the same height as my mama, but is definitely the widest and deepest woman I've ever seen, as if to make up for the height she doesn't have. The tall, fair-skinned blonde stares at me, appraisingly with her ice-blue eyes. By far the most terrifying, though, are the Zarsia, the Sigia, and the leader. Their appearance the most uncannily outlandish of the band. I can't decide who's worst. The slim, graceful, white-haired streaker, with the glowing eyes and the four, four-fingered hands, stands two heads taller than Whittled. She parts her lips, showing the tips of the long fangs she must use to drink the blood of her victims. 
The Sarasika stands just as tall, and now I'm so close, I can see her jet black skin actually has intricate ripples in it, like a slight breeze over still water. It would be beautiful, in another situation. The silver-headed leader with the bright green eye, tight blue skin with plates of silver and gold growing out of it, the long, elegant sword at his hip, and what I suspect is another kind of thunderstick on his back, though still colossal, is most of a head shorter than the Striga and the Zarsisa, but powerfully built, more than enough to make up for it. He stares down at me and the others all look to him. I've decided he's the most terrifying. He gestures to me with a silver and gold hand and says, Fucking hell. Look at a poor kid. He's petrified. He thinks you're demons. Me too. Answers the demon house that calls herself Twilla. Ooh. These helmets are going to be helping with that, are they? He declares. Helmets up. With that, he, the Sarsika, the walking armor and my captor, each bring their hands to their heads. Focusing on the green-eyed Cyclops, I'm briefly horrified into thinking he's tearing his own head off before I realize what I thought was his head is actually a helmet. Obviously, I thought about whether their metal hats might be helmets before, but I just thought they looked too seamlessly attached to the rest of them to be. The gigantic man's helmet now off. I can see he has a relatively normal face. Relatively. His skin is as pale as the blonde's. His two eyes are a bright, vivid green, and his hair is a fiery red like I've never seen on any Mazuri. But other than that, and how tall he is, he looks normal. I can't say the same for the two women who took their helmets off, though. Now fully able to appreciate the face of the one in the ridiculously heavy-looking armor, I can see her orange hair is frizzy, like wool. Her brow juts out way too far. Her nose is both too long and too wide, and her chin, well, doesn't exist. Her skin is more or less a normal colour, a little on the tan side, but it just makes her look like someone who works the fields. Well, that's not true of the Sar Seeker, though. The woman in the shiny cuirass, having already lost the title of tallest woman I've ever seen, to three of the other women in her group, just lost another title to a groupmate. Her skin is now the second darkest I've ever seen, not really counting the Striga, since her dark skin looks more like it comes from nighttime than sunlight. Where she looks like she spends every day outside in a land where it's always summer. The unhelmeted Sarsika looks like she spends every day outside in a land with five suns. Her eyes are a distinctive purple colour that I've never heard of a human's being, but she is also a woman who'd need to bend to not scrape her head on the ceiling of my house, so maybe her eyes aren't that strange. Her hair is the same jet black as her armour, and falls in tight, coarse crew ringlets to her shoulders. Her face, like the short ones, with the frizzy red hair, isn't ugly, but it is definitely strangely featured. Her mouth is just a little too wide, her cheeks just a little too flat, her nose both wide and flat, and her chin forming a perfectly sheer vertical surface from her bottom lip. See? asks the red-headed man. Oi, human. Uh, sept for tune. No offense, baby, he continues, turning his head to the streaker. Engine taken, Victor, chuckles the blue-skinned woman. Victor wishes to relay to thee that, with but one omission, all those thou seest before thee are of mankind, Powell. The lady with the blue skin? I ask wearily. Indubitably. What is she, then? I ask. Her kind are termed Don. What about the tall lady with very dark skin? The broad lady with the frizzy orange hair? You want me to believe they're humans? Before Twilla can answer, the one called Victor holds up his hand, seeming to have understood my question from context, and me looking at the women I'm talking about. 
He points his hand at me and says, Sapiens, then to himself, Sapiens, then to my leather-clad captor, the shorter, dark-skinned woman, the normal-looking man and the blonde, Sapiens, 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 Sapiens. Then he points to the really tall, really dark-skinned woman and says, Giovanni. Then he points to the relatively short, frizzy-haired woman and says, the Anderfowl. The blonde chimes in. It's pronounced Sapiens, Victor. Murfully. Not when I say it is not, he answers. As Victor doth so valiantly endeavour to express, Powell, the womenfolk thou hast designated are indubitably of mankind, but of a dissimilar ilk to thee thyself, and the collectivity of the other men here present. All right, you're humans, I say. So why are you not letting me leave? What are you planning to do with me? There's a pause before Twiller says, Guys, he's asked King what we're going to do with him. I think, at least, he's speaking some sort of Krausid blend of Central and Istian Lurupin languages. It makes it a little hard to understand him. My captors exchange glances with each other. The blonde eventually says, What can we do with him? Get him Vireki. Send hap up I scare soon, Fyodor. Bara pango till the morning, asks the streaker. The blonde man speaks for the first time I've heard. Oh yeah! Happy reunion day, everyone! Short mention, we kidnap your kid. Just for a day. Hope you don't mind. The red-headed man with the bright green eyes speaks. Beyond, right? Sorry, Toon. We can't keep him against his will. And a factor his sin means we cannot do the whole stool recon thing. Ah, phew. Yeah. Well, I gotta go back with him, make our shit norms, apologize for the trouble, and try our best to get across that we will be back tomorrow for proper introductions. Tell him that, please, if you can, Twiller. Quoff, Victor. We shall attend thee unto thy abode and effect genteel remorse to thy kinfolk until such time as we take leave assuring all of our ensuring return on the morrow, indisputably more apt a time for introductions, translates the demon house. It's lies. They want me to come quietly so they can threaten to kill me if the gates aren't opened for them. The nice side benefit for them is that if they surprise me, my terror will look much worse. If they told me what they plan to do now, by the time we got there, the effect would have worn off. With a great effort, I force myself to answer their lies with my own. Tell him, that's fine, I say through gritty teeth. Marvellous, proclaims the demon Twiller before addressing the others. He agrees, but before you go, would it be alright if I just got a little more of his language? Might be helpful for Yasmin to look at before tomorrow. The demon, Victor, waves his hand. Go ahead, Twiller. Powell, might I impose upon thee to relay to me one of thy tales before thou sally forth? Asks Twiller. You want me to tell you a story? I ask, slightly incredulous. Indubitably. What about? I ask, wondering why they would want to hear stories from someone they're about to use as leverage. The subject matter be of no great import, Whatsoever thou wishest. I think for a moment before I say, All right, I got one. Prithee, relay it, says the demon house excitedly. I clear my throat before starting. Off is a planet, far, far away. The light of chores, that takes sixteen and a half minutes to reach us here, takes so long to reach Earth that... When it does, you and I will have been dead for tens of thousands of years. He jabs a finger forward and 
and affect neutral tone commands. Zoom <laughs> them. Okay, I'm gonna have to check that. <laughs> Oh, come on. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the blonde man speaks for the first time I've heard. Oh, yeah. Happy reunion, dear. Everyone. <laughs> for fuck's sake. Oh, this is hard. 